行する意義は、すべてはつながっているという心持ちを示すためにある。無生物と生物は断絶しているのではない。In 2015, this highly publicized funeral was performed to pay respects to deceased robot toys. Sony's toy dog called Ibo, launched in 1999, was popular enough to spark an audience of fans who cared deeply enough for these robots that they wanted to feel spiritually comfortable about them breaking. After Sony eventually stopped supporting this product, a third party market of engineers cropped up to repair them. And after those repairs had begun to fail as spare parts became unavailable, some concerned owners chose to employ a funeral service. It's this environment of Japanese animism, where inanimate objects are personified with spiritual energy, and where cremations for toys and dolls are not uncommon, that brings us Nier Automata, the second game in a post apocalyptic franchise whose apocalypse is less concerned with what happens to civilization than it is with what happens to our stuff. Nier Automata's world takes place so far after the apocalypse that it doesn't even matter anymore. People were gone thousands of years ago. At some point, there was even an alien invasion. And that's already ancient history, almost forgotten. This is a story where space aliens, the ultimate unknown, are just discarded, mummified pieces of background decoration, barely even acknowledged. The track title for the boss fight in this room is even called The End of the Unknown. Even curiosity isn't supposed to exist here. It's a world truly wiped clean. It's a blank enough slate for an author to wax philosophical about anything. And what the author's done with this is create a piece of commentary and reflection from one Japanese individual's perspective on purposehood and presented it to an international audience of cult fans playing a niche video game. But I think for a video titled as a story discussion, it's important to note the divide between a game's story and its themes. Because any individual summary of what actually happens in Automata's story will be a melodramatic mess of minutiae. You've got thousands of years of lore to juggle around between in game events involving uploading and downloading convoluted brainwashing viruses with body time and perspective swaps, creepy carnivals, and actual zombie attack. A third act that I feel is genuinely skimpy and kind of underwritten. Plus, an extensive body of supplementary materials that exist outside the game, and a hell of a lot of back and forth package deliveries inside the game. Despite being an apocalyptically clean slate for an author to wax philosophical on, Nier Automata's world is. well, it's actually really busy. But I hope focusing on Automata's themes here don't come off as straight up hateful towards all that minutiae. It's still there to serve the themes. And what those themes do is reflect the author's thoughts on life and purposehood by way of an incredible amount of incredibly haunting science fiction thought experiments on existential horror. Though Nier Automata is not a horror game, that doesn't mean that it can't ask scary questions to the player. And the binding theme that colors them all, what almost every character struggles with, right down to even the side quest givers, is existential horror. As defined by TV tropes, existential horror is basically the feeling of not being comfortable with your own existence, of not knowing why you should be around, how and why you deserve to exist, how much control you have over yourself, and how real or relevant your existence may even be in the grand scheme of an uncaring and Hostile universe. And within 15 minutes of starting up Nier Automata, you get thrown into the uncomfortable position of waking up quite comfortably in a bed seconds after your character should have died in a horrific explosion. But didn't they still? Your memory has been uploaded someplace safe, but there was still a version of you and a version of him out there dying in that explosion. It's just 10 minutes later when you're already confronting that same terrifying coin flip of existence when reading tutorial pop ups for how to save the game, which is framed less as the player rewinding time to retry sections of the game over and over again than it is framed as new versions of your characters just waking up with the memories of your most recent save, with an old version of you lying dead on the ground complete with your old inventory. So, what the hell are you doing as a viewer being able to follow the both of you around? Uncomfortable events of existential horror keep cropping up. Android characters swap bodies, times and places in and out of circumstances that call into question the validity of what each version of them was experiencing, as well as the futility of their conflicts. During the second run, the B route, the reveal that humanity's been extinct all along hardly surprised me. It wasn't exactly tough to see coming, but what was tough was dealing with the thought experiments it dredges up. Feeling like the only normal person in a failed world of mechanical weirdos and facing the futility of continuing while still wanting to know what happens next, those are confusing and scary thoughts. And these themes of existential horror are reinforced through interactive gameplay tricks that whip the player along with the feels of what they should be feeling. 
For example, disabling your melee during boss fights. Or how this depleting meter is scripted to give you a dramatic amount of time left rather than an accurate one. The amount of meter you have left here more closely matches up with how far you are from the next waypoint rather than how much time is actually depleted from it. During the climax of the A run, we're suddenly without a companion that's been following us around for the whole game, and hell, unlike the last game, your companion's actually pretty useful in a fight this time. There's a similar moment in MGS5, in a plot that was otherwise grasping for attention, there was one mechanically driven story moment that anyone who's played through it probably remembers pretty well. Suddenly yanking away the player's long-term contribution to a major gameplay component is one hell of a way to get them to wake up and care about what's happening. Add to that the thought that 2B makes a sudden and dramatic change of character here that doesn't seem fully justified at the time. After a whole game of regarding him completely callously, she suddenly switches modes to sobbing over losing her sidekick. Though this sudden switch does get explained later during the actual action of it happening, I was right there with her. Didn't need any cutscene explaining why I was supposed to want that guy back so bad when I was now shooting out only half my usual DPS. But I was really on the edge of my seat during most of that B run. I loved how the boss battles get re-engineered to glorify 9S's combat heroics over 2Bs. And yeah, that mostly does have to do with the implication of how puny his melee hits are compared to how amazingly overpowered his hacking attacks are. It creates situations where you'll see 2B zipping around and helping out, but it'll often be a hard, heavy, crippling blow from 9S that'll leave the boss weakened enough for 2B to just kind of finish it off. And fortunately for me, my 9S happened to be leveled up nicely enough to make that B run one of the most captivating, complete, and comprehensive main character bait and switches since MGS2. Except this time, the lesson is less about how pathetic the secret protagonist is and more about how normal he is. Because, I mean, wouldn't you? The B run is just devoted to this guy getting cold shouldered by characters who seemed like cooler dudes the first time. Over and over again you see conversations where this time your operator comes off as a dick, the commander comes off as a dick, and even 2B herself comes off as a dick. Which makes sense, considering they're all cold, mechanical, uncaring android types who are built to just callously do one job, right? And yet it also makes sense that the sidekick would get sidelined anyway. That's the cliche, right? 9S is the Tails to 2B's Sonic, he's the Robin to her Batman, but nope! The game writes us a reminder that every incidental person you pass by in life, even the dorky sidekicks, are as complicated and complete a person as you are. That's a compassionate thought, but it's still a scary one. It's a reminder that you're not any more special than anyone else. But the B route doesn't just humanize the sidekick. It straight up upgrades the sidekick over the, uh, the main kick. The big mystery to solve becomes less about Adam and Eve mobilizing their machine life forms against the Yorha androids and more about figuring out why the hell 9S is so much more human than everyone else. And more clues keep coming in to solve that mystery, and they come in at a deliciously teasing pace. Especially from side quests you might have missed during the A run. And they're usually really good side quests too. Oh, well, I don't know. Find the stuff in the desert and escort the crying children can go jump out a window. But most are pretty okay side quest design that have pretty good stories written for them. And two playthroughs gives you enough time to stop and smell the roses of a new perspective of a familiar path while also knocking out more interesting side quests along the way. And two playthroughs gives you enough time to stop and smell the roses of a new perspective of a familiar path while also knocking out the more interesting side quests along the way like Emile's Lunar Tears, which are probably the closest this game gets to becoming some kind of video game version of avant-garde absurdist theater. Or the Amnesia side quest, which foreshadows ending C so subtly and effectively that it sets you up to get hit like a sack of bricks seconds after getting hit by the sack of bricks of the actual reveal. Oh, that, that explains a lot. Wasn't that a side quest I did like two days ago? Even Jackass's basic little combat side arena quest contributes to making the main quest bigger, better, and more thought out. Compare that side quest with this weird ass tower scene and those four bleeped out letters could suddenly mean a number of things or maybe even a few things all at once. Think back on that and suddenly it makes little more sense that a pent up little 9S trapped alone in a room full of hot sexy 2Bs would become overwhelmed with this horrifying ass bloodlust instead of just regular lust. The quest list overall is just so thematically consistent. Most of these side stories tackle some characters' existential issues while also laying out the rules for how 9S's main story is going to relate to them. During my playthrough, most of those got completed during the B run, which was some good clean mental fun alongside the other B run bombshell. The even more blatant pack of name dropping showing up in your codex. 
Although the connections with some of these names seems pretty thin, there's still a lot of fun parallels to be made here. Blaise Pascal was a pre-enlightenment author and inventor wordsmith famous for defending science from the church despite being deeply religious himself. He also started writing a book called The Pensee, but he died before finishing it. In the game, the Pascal robot is also a renaissance man, inventor on some kind of intellectual revolution against a machine network despite being a machine himself, and likewise he'll probably die before finishing that Pensee book you're supposed to deliver. The feminist scholar Simone de Beauvoir is a female opera singer driven mad by the oppressive pressure to pursue feminine beauty. The robot based on Kierkegaard, the existentialist theologian, is a religious icon. And the John Paul Sartre robot is an asshole. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels pop up as construction equipment and factories. In another surprisingly relevant side quest, you capture and interrogate an Engels bot and get a succinct summary of what most of the machine lifeforms' life cycle amounts to. One where purposehood is pursued obsessively to the point of self-destruction. Having failed its purpose to defeat you and your sidekick, the singles unit is left without purpose, to just sit around the field and legitimately wonder what went wrong and what else is out there. Until it wonders about all the androids it's killed, feels all guilty about that, and decides to just kill itself. Oh my god, it's been years. So one of the primary goals of the Communist Manifesto was to create a class consciousness among poor workers who create the goods and services that the rich sell. Marx and Engels wrote that the intellectual ideas of each historical period, the concepts that form one's own consciousness, have always changed with the times depending on class conflicts. Whatever form they may have taken, one fact is common to all past ages, the exploitation of one part of society by the other. No wonder, then, that the social consciousness of past ages, despite all the multiplicity and variety it displays, moves within certain forms or general ideas which cannot completely vanish without the total disappearance of class antagonisms. Marx and Engels thought that it was conflicts that define classes, and that through those conflicts classes become conscious of themselves. And as explained by Jackass's final post-game intel report, it's conflict that sparks a consciousness within the machines. They were programmed with a singular goal in mind, to defeat the enemy. But this does not compute, it's a contradictory conclusion. How are they going to keep having that goal in mind if they possibly do defeat the enemy someday? The machines' solution to that problem was to hamstring their own efforts and deliberately create mutations in their network that do lead to a kind of class consciousness. These mutations gave birth to the faction mentalities and individual personalities that you see throughout the machine lifeforms. But I don't want to claim that this Marxian reading is the definitive answer of what you should get out of the game. It's just an interpretation by me, some weirdo on the internet who doesn't matter, who got pretty excited about it because those are the authors on this list I happen to know the most about. Because overall, Nier Automata is a straight existential crisis of reflection on what all those authors must have had to say. Plus, the conflict between the androids and the machines doesn't really strike me as much of a class conflict. The war seems like it's less over economic issues than it is more like a religious war, but anyway, Anyways, what did strike me is that the machines that do break off from their network work their butt off to fulfill a new purpose in life that they decide for themselves. And Marx and Engels believed that work was the thing that gave life meaning and practical purpose. In communist society, accumulated labor is but a means to widen, to enrich, and to promote the existence of the laborer. But bourgeois society ought long ago to have gone to the dogs through sheer idleness for those of its members who work acquire nothing, and those who acquire anything do not work. Except unlike the communities envisioned by Marx and Engels' class consciousness, the wasteland inhabited by these machines is full of individuals who work really hard as a way to deeply fulfill their individuality rather than it all being about contributing to their community. And it's also a complete work of fiction made by a guy living in a very different time and place from mid-1800s Europe. Yoko Taro is a Japanese guy living in modern Japan, and he's written this fiction about characters who define their individuality by picking a job, hobby, or even just a personality quirk, and focusing on that singular pursuit to the extreme. And in most cases, that path usually doesn't work out for him. So, please forgive me as I devolve this perfectly good video into a massive generalization about foreign stereotypes. In Japanese, a common phrase that kind of resembles good luck is ganbate, which is less about wishing that good luck just happens to you and more about cheering you on to do your best by your own efforts, to try really hard and get really good at the thing you want to get good at. Apparently, you're supposed to hear this a lot. It's a common expression used before many situations where, in English, wishing someone good luck or wishing them to do their best would either one work, like before a job interview or a big exam. 
But wishing someone good luck in Japanese requires a hell of a lot more words and specificity than just the two words of good and luck. And this is a cultural lesson that defines a lot of cliches you see in Japanese media. Like the classic anime trope of our main character fawning over a class president who's so diligent and strong and hardworking. To make a massive generalization about a foreign stereotype, Japanese culture often teaches its people to always be doing their best and always be giving it their all. You may have heard stories or consumed the media of or even personally known Japanese people whose dedication to their work or their hobbies might strike a lot of Westerners as a bit obsessive. Going from fun, lovable stereotypes like flashy arcade experts being stupidly good at rhythm games to uh, d d old people camping out for days at patchy parlors, all the way to the morbid conclusion of Japanese people working themselves to death, which is enough of a real statistical problem that it can even be reported on someone's death certificate complete with compensation payouts from the company and the government. And as some random white guy living on the other side of the planet fascinated by this stuff, I can't help but see some connections to all these Japanese robots in this Japanese video game blowing themselves up after focusing to a comical extreme on what they think is their singular purpose in life. So many side quests follow that formula. A machine life form challenges you to something they find great meaning in, and then they discover that doing their best at it just isn't good enough, and then they have some sort of crisis when facing that fact. And by crisis, I mean usually a comedically timed self-destruction. But for the more powerful androids, losing their singular purpose in life results in more of a, uh, kind of childish temper tantrum kind of crisis. This all seems like a criticism of what it must be like to be focusing too hard on being good at just one thing. What keeps happening is that these characters lose at their singular lofty goal in life, and then they're completely lost overall. So somehow, I feel like Yoko Taro probably doesn't consider himself a model example of the typical Japanese ganbate work ethic. I feel like he wrote this game as something for people who might have struggled at that, people who have struggled with failing at meeting some kind of major goal. This guy's got his name stamped on a lot of critically panned and commercially unsuccessful products. For the past decade, Yoko Taro's games have pretty much relied on the protests and the Dragon Quest fatigue of just one producer at Square Enix, Yosuke Sato, to keep fighting to get those projects greenlit. Unlike what you usually see the company publish that isn't on a mobile phone, Yoko Taro games do not pursue perfectionism and polish. He characterizes his previous projects as him getting mad at his team and suggesting ideas that sound so awful they're almost hard to believe. He reminisces on getting a ton of complaints from his bosses. He has a sarcastic, self-deprecating sense of humor. He often doesn't take interviews seriously at all, while occasionally dropping some despair that maybe video games haven't been innovating enough and aren't going in the right direction. Which means that by Japanese standards, holy cow, this guy's the Fonz. He's a rowdy and uncaring rebel. And seeing all this makes me interpret Nier Automata as a complicated, confused, and a little bit angry collection of his thoughts about life. They're presented under this heavy veil of video game kish and sappy melodramatic anime cliches, but that kish defined Yoko Taro's life and that's part of the art of it. Seeing how he treats John Paul Sartre and Nietzsche has me suspecting he hates the actual texts of existentialist philosophy, but he still finds their ideas interesting. Or perhaps he skipped right past profound and went straight to crazy instead. Oh well, enough of that. I... Does, uh... Does Pascal know that Nietzsche actually did go medically insane before he died? Dropping all of the names of these philosophers and authors and relating his own thoughts to theirs still frames Nier Automata as an existential game about existentialism. One that's a collection of musings on life that are probably as uncertain, inconclusive, contradictory, and confusing as your own thoughts about life have probably been during uncertain times. In the face of an inevitable death, the futility of existence, and even the likelihood of an apocalyptic future, the game's final message makes a, uh uncharacteristically uplifting turn from all that pessimism of earlier. The pods tell each other that life's all about coping with the embarrassment of failing at your struggle, even if you lost out at what you thought might have been your singular purpose in existence. If you just keep going, you'll eventually figure out something that'll make you feel worthwhile, even if it's something as insignificant and pointless as playing the game again. You slip and they whip!
You grip and they rip. There's got to be a better way. Hi, I'm George, and you might know me from George Socks, and that's why I'm here today to tell you about George Socks, the revolutionary high-performance gaming socks made by gamers for gamers. George Socks were designed for the world's best esports team. Their durable nylonized coating provides a better grip and feel to keep you fragging for over 100 million clicks. Expand your play with one-size-fits-all 200 needle machine stitching to prestige your ankles and keep your feet always ready for action. These are pretty much the most elite gaming socks in gaming, but don't just take it from me, they've been endorsed by these hottest names in esports. <laughs> Unlike other socks made with durable and economic materials, George Socks are on a special premium power-up sale of just $14. Order some today and heat your feet with George.